Living Word is brought to you by International Central Gospel Church. Welcome once again to the Living Word. I'm Pastor Mesa Otabel. It's a joy and a privilege to be able to minister God's Word to you. Today I'm ministering on defending your portion. You know, when God gives you something, it's yours. But just because it's yours does not mean it's going to stay with you. There will be fights, there will be attacks. The enemy will want to take away from you that which is yours. He wants to take away your joy, your happiness, your progress, your promotion, your marriage, your business. You have to learn to defend your portion. So today I'm going to teach you how to do that. So when you're blessed with something, it stays in your hand. It doesn't leave your hand. Let's get into the session as we learn how to defend our portion. And now, today's message. My message is titled, Defend Your Portion. Defend Your Portion. Defend your portion. Many times God blesses us with things. We, ex we receive things from the Lord. We experience His favor. We experience His goodness. And then we lose it. Uh, people pray for things. And when the things happen, they lose it. Some people pray for a job. And then they lose the job. Or they pray for healing. And they lose the healing or they pray for God to give them a good marriage and they somehow lose it. There, there, is, there is something we have to do in order to protect the things that God has blessed us with. So turn with me in your Bibles to Second Samuel chapter 23 verse 8 to verse number 12. And this is an account of what the Bible describes as the mighty men of David. David, as you know, was a warrior, was a military man, and he had people around him who were called mighty men, who in current terms you will call them special forces or commandos or people who were special training, uh, who had special training to do special things in the military. And the Bible talks about three of those great mighty men of David and their exploits. And I'm going to focus on one of them because what he did is related to our message today. It reads, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph Bashabeth, the Tachmonite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite. That's a nice nickname, isn't it? Adino the Esnite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had re retreat, retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary. And his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to plunder. Verse 11. And he's the one we're focusing on. After him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop. There was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. This was a time when there was lots of wars. In those days, we didn't have the kinds of treaties we have now at the UN, ECOWAS, or AU. 
where there was territorial sovereignty and when you had your property you could uh, be sure that nobody would come to take it from you in those days nations gained wealth not through productivity but through warfare and so when you built somebody will come and take your building when you planted somebody will come and take your field from you and so always you had to not only produce but defend what you have produced and one of the perennial enemies of the Israelites were the Philistines because they were neighbors and anytime the people of Israel uh, produced something these Philistines will come to come and dispossess them and at this time they had developed a farm lentils a plantation they were hoping to eat from their produce and all of a sudden the Philistines come to take from them what they had labored for and uh, the Bible says the people fled but one man stood and defended his portion what do I mean by your portion each one of us have what is your portion your portion represents several things first it represents your destiny as God has determined it God has a destiny for each one of us he has a place for us in his plans your destiny is that place of honor and significance that God has laid aside for you it includes your spiritual heritage your salvation your relationship with God your faith in Christ divine healing the provisions of the promises of God uh, and so on and so forth these are your portion whatever God promises you in the scripture it's your portion it's your destiny is where God wants you to be or how God wants your life to turn out never allow anyone to tell you that your place on earth is useless and never allow anyone to tell you that God has no plans for you your destiny is your portion second your portion reflects your God-given gifts and talents for us to arrive at our destiny God has given us gifts he has blessed us with unique gifts and unique abilities these also will include your spiritual gifts the callings of God upon your life what God has chosen you to do these are your gifts and although these gifts are given by God they may not be in operation because sometimes we allow Satan to take the gifts of God from us or to deny us from developing and using our gifts your gift is your portion it's something God has given to you if you don't defend it somebody is going to take it from you thirdly your portion represents the opportunities that God brings your way when you develop your gifts well God will arrange events and situations to your advantage so that you can manifest what he has given you to the rest of the world each one of us will be given opportunity in life an advantage in life an open door in life that opportunity is your portion you have to defend it and finally your portion represents your achievements and your successes everything you have achieved everything you have obtained in life a relationship with God a good name an education a profession an acquisition a business enterprise your marriage it's an achievement it's something you've done successfully and that's your portion but you have to learn to defend your portion anytime God gives you something your portion anytime God blesses you with something adversaries will contend with you over them there will arise enemies there will arise people 
there will arise Satan himself to fight you over what God has blessed you with. You don't even have to invite him. He will come. The devil is attracted to every project God is involved in. The devil is attracted to every person that God is interested in. When God shows interest in your life, Satan will also show interest in your life. And so you have to know that adversaries will contend with you. An adversary simply means somebody who works opposite of you. Somebody who works against you, not in your interest, but against you. Our chief adversary is Satan, but he also works with his age agent, both spiritual and physical. The devil works with demons, with all kinds of spiritual cohorts. He also works with human beings. He speaks to people and he directs people to try to take from you what God has given to you. And so it was with David's army that they had planted their field. They had labored over their field. They had toiled over their field. I'm sure they had prayed over it. They had committed sweat to it. Now the lentils had grown. It is bearing fruit. It is time to enjoy the fruit. And all of a sudden, the adversary comes to take from them. Many times when we have labored for something and we are just about to reap, that is when the enemy comes in. And if you read the account, two things happened. The Bible says... The Philistines gathered as a troop and they came in. They surrounded the Israelites and came to dispossess them. The first thing you notice is that the enemies will come. When God blesses you, the enemies will come. Don't invite them, they will come, they invite themselves. Satan is a gate crusher. He would gate crush into your marriage when you haven't asked him to come. Just when the marriage is getting well, that's when he gate crashes. Just when you have gone through struggle and things are about to work out, he gate crashes. Just when you are invested so much in your education you're going to sit your final exam in order to get your certificate or your degree he gate crashes just when you have grown in life you've worked so hard you are about to go on retirement to enjoy the blessing of god over your life he gate crashes the enemy will come but not only does the enemy come look at what happens friends will flee it seems as if the, the entrance of enemies signals the exit of friends. The Bible says when the enemies come or came, the Israelites fled. They fled. They left their field. They left the thing they had worked for. And Shama was left alone because many times in the battles of life you're going to fight alone you're not going to have anybody there with you if you want your best friends to be there when you are in trouble you're a joker the poor has no friend you only have friends when things are going well for you, when everything is fine and everybody wants to be your friend. But just get into trouble. Then one by one, they leave with nice excuses. You turn to the left, to the right, and you say, but 
Last year I had so many friends. This year what has happened? You are in trouble. When you are in trouble, you lose friends. People are going to abandon you. And you will be left alone. So this soldier, Shama, is left alone with his field of lentils. What is he going to do? He can also elect to flee. He can also run away from the battle. Because at this time, he's totally outnumbered. The question people ask many times when they go through difficulty is, why me? Have you asked that question? Why me? The question I ask you today is, why not you? Why me? What, who else should have the problem? You think the problem should go to somebody else? Why me? Because you are you. Why not somebody else? We wish every problem goes to our next door neighbor. But the next door neighbor also wishes the problem will go to his next door neighbor. Unfortunately, you are the next door neighbor. The next door neighbor wants the problem to go to. So it lands on your doorstep. So why does the enemy attack? I'll give you four reasons why the enemy attacks. First, the enemy attacks basically because you are not on his side. You are not on his side. The attackers were Philistines. They were of a different troop. They were not on the side of the Israelites. The enemy attacks because you are not on his side. You belong to a different group. For Israel, they were a different nation. They worshipped a different God and they had different beliefs. You came under attack because you are different. Because you are not one of them. People don't attack you because you are like them. They attack you because you are different. If you don't want attack in this world, don't be different. Be like everybody else. Blend in. Fit in nicely and everybody will be happy with you. But if you do that, you will never do anything extraordinary. If you're going to achieve anything extraordinary, you have to stand out from the crowd. But when you stand out from the crowd, it is easy for you to be targeted. It's because you are different. Secondly, the enemy attacks because you are producing results. The ground was producing lentils. When you are unfruitful, people leave you alone. We say in our local proverb that the tree that bears fruit is the one that has the stick lying underneath. That simply means people who use stick to pluck fruit, they don't pluck fruits from a fruitless tree. So when you see sticks around your life, it simply means somebody has seen fruit on your life. Your fruitfulness, your productivity, the results you are producing will attract somebody. And so they attacked them because they were producing results. Not because they were just living their lives, wallowing in non-productivity. Who cares? Just stay in life and do nothing and you will have peace of mind. Do nothing. Don't have any great idea. Don't have any great dreams. Don't aspire to greatness. Don't seek to achieve anything. Just agree with everybody's opinion. Whatever people say, say yes sir. Or say you are my friend. Say I agree with you. And you'll be the best person to everybody. But you'll be the worst person to yourself. If you are going to try to do something with your life, somebody will want to pluck your fruit when it ripes. So, you get attacked because you are producing results. 
the land was attacked because it was producing lentils. Thirdly, you get attacked because your success is a threat. For somebody who wishes your downfall, when you succeed, it diminishes their power. You threaten them. And so they are going to seek to stop this threat. You know, you go through life, life is very funny, isn't it? You go through life minding your own business. And in your mind, you are not troubling anybody because you have not gone to anybody's field. This land they are producing from, it's not Philistine land, it's Israelite land. Now, why should you be bothered? You to go and plant your lentils, but why do you want my lentils? Well, welcome to the planet Earth, where people steal other people's lentils. Sometimes your success just annoys people. It threatens them. Somebody just sees you married, and you holding your husband's hand, your husband holding your hand, if you are a woman, and you walking hand in hand, and somebody is just looking on and is angry. You have not stolen their husband, you have not said anything to them, but your success reminds them of their failure. It threatens them. It makes them angry. It makes them upset. And people will prefer to pull everybody to their level instead of rising to a higher level. And so your success is a threat, it's an annoyance to somebody else and that's why they're going to attack you. And fourthly, people will attack you because your success will encourage others to trust God. Your success will encourage other people, especially the devil would make sure you don't have a testimony. Because your testimony will encourage somebody else to believe God. Your testimony will make somebody else trust God for something good to happen to them. So they have to stop you so that you don't reproduce more people like yourself. For the people of the Philistines who came to attack the land, it was because they don't want anybody to have another farm. They said in their hearts, I suppose, if this farm succeeds, another person will have a farm, another person will have a farm, another person will have a farm, and pretty soon everybody has a farm, and, and, and they're going to be prosperous, and they're going to be mightier. So in order to stop the success story from spreading to many people kill the one who starts the success story and remember this whenever you are the first to start anything successful you will come under intense attack whenever you are the first in any endeavor whether the first in your family to build a house, the first in your family to have a wedding, the first in your family to go to university, the first in your family to travel abroad, the first in your family to have children, whatever you are the first in, you come under special attacks. Because the adversary, Satan, would make sure he doesn't allow you to start. Because when you start and you are successful, you will infect people with your success. And since he is a master of failure, he would make sure nobody breaks through so the story cannot spread. And that is why some of you who are pioneers come under intense attack because Satan doesn't want your story to spread now you can be a coward and run from your lentil field or you can be like Shama 
and position yourself to defend your lentil field. Even when people have abandoned you, you have to consider that what you are protecting is not only for you, it's an inspiration to people after you. And you have to defend. So, you know, you have to stand firm when God gives you a blessing. It's your responsibility to receive the blessing, but not only to receive the blessing, but also to keep the blessing. Whatever God gives to you, there will be warfare surrounding it. And you have to learn to win the battles of life. I trust that you will win every battle, that what is yours will be defended, that you'll be able to hold what God has blessed you with till the end. May God bless you and keep you. I'm Pastor Mesa Otabel. I'll be with you again next week. Shalom, peace, and life to you. Thank you for making time to watch Living Word. Living Word is brought to you by International Central Gospel Church. You're once again welcome to the Living Word. I'm Pastor Mesa Otterbill. I'm concluding my message defending your portion. When God blesses you with something, it's yours. But whatever God blesses you with will have warfare surrounding it. People will fight you, circumstances will come against you, and you have to learn to defend your portion. Whether it's your marriage, it's your business, your children, your health, whatever you have, there will be warfare, but when warfare comes, you don't run from the battle. You stay, you fight by, by faith, you fight by prayer, you stand on the promises of God, you stand on the word of God, and you defend what is yours. So let's get into the session as we conclude. Defend your portion. And now, today's message. Some of us have to be successful so the pattern of failure in our families will change. We have to change our family story, our family history. Some of us come from families where nobody has built a house. And you are the first one attempting to own a house. And you are coming against hell itself. You have to be like Shama. You have to stand and say, if everybody flees, my grandfather ran from this farm, my father ran from this farm, my uncles have been running from this farm, my aunties have run, but I will stay in this place, I will win the victory, so the story of my success will get to the next generation. You have to defend your portion. What God has given to you, don't let it leave your hand. You must defend it. You must fight, you must resist, and you must win this battle. Because it's not just about you, it's about generations after you. When some of us were starting charismatic churches, we came against intense pressure. Now anybody can get up and start a church and call it any name and go scot-free. Why do people lose their portion? Why do people lose the thing that God has blessed them with? Why do they lose it? I'm going to give you four reasons. First, 
because of discouragement by reason of the attacks they get discouraged because people are attacking them every time talking about them every time criticizing them every time everything they do is criticized everything they have to achieve they have to fight to get it and so they get discouraged and sometimes you look at other people who are getting what you are looking for without any fight and for you it seems as if for you everything is a fight you see we are all fighting different battles what you are fighting is different from what they are fighting they too something else may be difficult for them which is easy for you but you also have a point where almost everything is a battle and you have to fight sometimes for your health you look at people who are well they mistreat their bodies they are well they they drink they are well they smoke they are well they overeat they are well you take a little sugar you are in trouble a little fat you are in trouble every little thing it's as if your everything is a battle and you get discouraged and you leave the battle but remember you have to win that battle for those coming after you who are going to be faced with this same giant if you leave the giant unconquered your children will have to come and fight them you have to deal with them in your time secondly people lose their portion because of diverted focus and attention sometimes as people go through life their focus and attention leaves they start pursuing diff different things and as a result they lose what god has blessed them with and it happens in so many ways you know even pastors somebody believes he is called of god starts a church church is doing well for a year or two church is doing well and then all of a sudden he gets diverted diverted with so many things some people get diverted with traveling and a pastor can travel for six months and leave his church because you know talking to the same people is is boring believe you me i've been doing this job for 25 years to these people <laughs> it's boring it's not exciting you come and stand in front of the same people and say the same thing and keep saying it and keep saying it it's boring sometimes you want change you want to do something different that diverted focus will make you lose your portion because if i lose my attention what i think is boring today will not even be there for it to bore me so i have to keep my focus people marry and they are happy with their marriage but they get diverted because it's the same boring husband same boring wife same boring house same boring bed i won't go any further so they divert attention they're looking for excitement and when you do that you lose your passion remember what god has blessed you with and keep it because you're not just keeping it for yourself you're keeping for those coming after you diverted focus and attention diminish passion and interest people lose passion lose interest they're no longer passionate one of the things i pray to god about is never to lose my passion for preaching after all these years of preaching and my wife will tell you i never take what i do for granted never i never get up one week to say oh this week let me just go and say something never the same energy as a matter of fact the energy is even going higher I devote more time now preparing to preach than I used to do when I started because this is what God has given me if I lose the passion take the people for granted come in here and just tell them a Nancy stories I will lose them and then I will realize after they are gone that getting them back is more difficult than getting them in the first place 
It's like everything else. You have to be passionate and keep it. Fourth, people lose what they have because they disdain their gifts and their callings. They disdain what they have. And many times they do that simply because they are comparing themselves with other people. Somebody will always have what you don't have. I think you have to come to terms with that. Listen to me, married people. In your eyes, your husband is the best. But believe you me, there are nice guys out there. In your eyes, your wife is the best. But believe you me, there are nice girls out there. The fact that you like what you have does not mean that nothing will be there that is also good. And if you despise what you have, you'll be interested in something else. If you despise your own business, despise your own church. As a pastor who <laughs> had a program in his church, this is a true story. Ridiculous but true. Program in his church. He invited a guest speaker. And the guest speaker came and the church was full. And his leaders came to tell him, the church is full, it's overflow, people are sitting outside. Aren't you coming for the service? Because by this time he was at home. And they were excited that for once their church is overflown. The pastor says, I'm not coming. They said, why are you not coming? He said, when I'm preaching, they don't come. <laughs> now that I've brought somebody, they have come. They should go and go and listen to that person, not me. People lose what they have because they despise it. They despise what they have. Either it's too little, it's too small, it's not as big as what somebody else has, it's not as nice as what somebody else has, your business is not as prosperous, your church is not that big, your marriage doesn't seem to be as happy as the other person. Remember, there are, in this world, there's a lot of pretense. There are people who are nice outside and terrible inside. So if all you see is, look at that man, look at the way he treats his wife. He's always saying, honey, 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 honey. Maybe outside his wife is honey, but inside she's lemon. You don't know. You don't know. But you look outside and say, ah, you don't call me honey. You don't call me too, I am a honey. Me to call me honey. <laughs> don't disdain and despise what you have. Because if you do, you will lose it. As bad as you think it is, it is God's gift to you. Now, Shama is standing with his friends in their field. I suppose maybe they were working on their field. And Philistine troops surround them. I'm sure the people who ran, some of them were saying, it doesn't matter. We'll go and start another farm. My life is not worth this farm. If you want to defend it, defend it. Next year too, we'll plant. I'm sure they had all kinds of excuses, but they left the field. Something they had worked for, something they were anticipating to reap, they left it because opposition has shown up. And this man was left alone. I'm just here to let you know, whatever God gives you, you have to fight to keep it. And don't make cheap excuses and say, it doesn't matter. Oh, this one, it doesn't matter. It will be fine. It may be the only opportunity you have. Fight for it. Contend for it. I'm going to take you through how this man fought for and defended his portion. I'm going to show you three things 
he did. Let's look at his defense strategy, Shaman's defense strategy. What did he do? If you read verse 12, the Bible says he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. I like how it ends. It says, so the Lord brought about a great victory. But throughout, it doesn't say the Lord was the one who defended it. The Lord was the one who fought. The Lord was the one who killed the Philistines. But in the end, it is God who gets the glory. It gives me the impression that what was at stake was the glory of God. What was at stake is who gets the glory. If you win, God gets the glory. If Satan wins, he gets the glory. May I just suggest to you, my friends, that what is at stake is not even your reputation or your business or your marriage. It is the glory of God. It is the glory of God. You may think it's your own battle, you are fighting your own battle, but it is God's glory. If that business succeeds, God will get the glory. And God knows you will give him the glory. And Satan wants to make sure you never give God the glory. It is the glory of God. This is a spiritual warfare you are fighting in the name of the Lord. Three things that he did. Number one, the Bible says he positioned himself in the middle of the field. He positioned himself in the middle of the field. Not outside the field. In the middle of the field. Where you position yourself is very important. How you position yourself in relation to what you have is important. What does it mean that he positioned himself in the middle of the field? It means he acknowledged his inheritance. He was saying, this is mine. This is my blessing. This is my field. This is mine and I'm not going to leave this place. He positioned himself in the middle of of his field he acknowledged this is mine this is my inheritance this is my blessing this is what God has given to me it also means he accepted personal responsibility personal responsibility what Shama was saying was if you are gone, I am here. If I die, I want to die trying to rescue this field. If I die, I don't want to be die in the hands of the Philistines in a strange land. I want to die in my field. It's personal responsibility. You may never have people supporting you, my friends. Sometimes in life, you struggle with no help. Nobody will help you. Nobody will come and encourage you. If you're looking for encouragement, you may never get it. It's your own struggle. You must fight it. It's your fight. Nobody has been called to fight your fight for you. If you want to break through in life, it's your fight. That business you started, it's your fight. And if you go to people asking them for money and they don't give you, don't get angry with them. It's not their fight. It's your fight. That marriage, it's your fight. That health problem you have to be well, it's your fight. The sickness is not on anybody. If you don't accept personal responsibility, nobody's going to fight for you. Sometimes I see people fighting things, but they don't take personal responsibility. Sometimes even people are fighting health problems. They go to the hospital and you ask them, what does the doctor say? They say, ah, I don't know. What did you ask him? The doctor says, ah, uh, it looks like something. And, and people will say something like, when I ask the doctor, he gets annoyed. Yes, because he's not the one who is sick. You are the sick one. If he's annoyed, put pressure on him because it's your body. And if it's your body, take personal responsibility. And don't just sit down and say, oh, well, I don't know. I'm, I, I, don't relinquish your life 
and the authority of your life and put it in somebody's hand. Nobody can care for you like you. Take charge of your life. Position yourself in your inheritance. Stand where God has placed you. It's your marriage. It's your life. It's your children. Nobody is obliged to take care of your children. Nobody is obliged to help you succeed in life. You are obliged to help yourself succeed in life. It's your responsibility. Because when the enemies come, the friends will leave. But it's fine. It's fine. Let them leave. Don't be upset. Don't be angry. Don't curse them. Let them go. But position yourself where God has called you. Acknowledge what you have. Take personal responsibility. Second thing he did. He defended, the Bible says he defended his ground. He took position and started defending. Defense is not the same as attack. Later you find he attacked. But before you attack, you defend. You make sure the enemy doesn't trespass. What does it mean by he defended his ground? It means he protected what God had given him. He protected it. He made sure it would not fall into enemy hands. He ensured that every little bit of what he had would be well secured. Defend what you have. It also means that he pushed the enemy backwards. He pushed the enemy backwards. He told the enemy, you can't come in and take my field. Go back. He pushed the enemy. He pushed the enemy. You have to learn to push. Push them backwards. Push that sickness backwards. Push that trouble backwards. It's coming into your life, but don't let it get to the center of the field. Because if he gets to the middle of the field, it is the owner of the field. And that is why he positioned himself in the middle and defended from the middle, pushing them outwards. Because the middle was the center of his possession. He defended his ground. Third thing. The Bible says he killed the Philistines. That means he attacked you don't defend and kill. If you kill, it means he attacked. He went on the offensive. He went on the offensive. He started going against what was attacking him. It's not enough to defend. You have to also know how to go on the offensive. Don't just leave yourself to be attacked at will by people. Everybody feels like talking rubbish to you, they come and talk rubbish to you. Everybody feels like insulting you, they come and insult you for free. And you say, ask me, I'm a Christian. It's okay. I give it to the Lord. Don't let anybody take your Christianity as a sign of weakness. And don't let people walk on you as a doormat because you are a child of God. You are born again. Every time you, you want to be strong, they'll say, well, but your Bible says, and they, but they attack you and they don't quote the Bible. You have to be strategic. What does that mean that he attacked the Philistines? It means he eliminated the threat to his inheritance. He made sure that field will be secure. And you have to make sure that field that God has given to you is secure. This year as we talk about breakthrough, you will have the portion. But when you have your portion, don't lose it. Don't get a portion in January and lose it in March. Don't get a blessing in August and lose it in December. Don't get your breakthrough in 2010 and lose it in 2011. Whatever God gives you, you must fight for. You must defend. 
and you must protect. It means also that he exalted the name of the Lord. Your victory is God's victory. Your success is God's success. Your breakthrough is God's breakthrough. Your favor is God's favor. When God wants to magnify himself in the earth, he can't just be in heaven and magnify himself. Who sees it? Nobody. He can't magnify himself in the skies. If God wants to magnify his name, he has to do it where people see it. And he does it in your life, in my life. When we win the battle, then people know the God we serve. When we get that breakthrough, then people know the God we serve. When we rise on top, then people know the God we serve. I pray and I trust God that whatever portion he has given to you, whatever you hold in your hand, you would not lose it, you would defend it, you will push the enemy backwards, you will eliminate the threat, and the portion you have grown, you will live to eat the fruit of your labor. You will not die prematurely. You will not be cut short prematurely. Your success will not be taken away from you. You will live to enjoy your success for your children and for your children's children. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Give God praise somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. So my friend, you've realized that when God blesses you, it's yours. It's your blessing. It's your health. It's your body. It's your marriage. It's your family. It's your promotion. But just because it's yours does not mean that it's going to stay that way. The enemy will come. There will be spiritual attacks. There will be mental attacks. There will be physical attacks. Friends may come against you. But whatever is yours, don't just let it go. Hold on. Defend your portion. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. God is with you. And what he has blessed you with will stay in your hand. And I pray that whatever God has blessed you with will stay in your hand, that you'll be able to hold on to the end. Well, I'll be with you again next week. I'm Pastor Mensah Otabel. Shalom, peace, and life to you. Thank you for making time to watch Living Word. 